Okay. Welcome to Calvary Bible Baptist Church. If you take your uh, Bible tonight, turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 3. We're going to continue to expound the text. Uh, there's a lot here. Uh, there's a lot of teaching from the Apostle Paul through the Holy Spirit. For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, accordingly as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Let's open a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your blessings, and your truths. We thank you for all that we have and enjoy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Paul's writing, and he says, For I say through the grace given unto me. We're saved by grace. We're kept by grace. Now, what it means is that we're saved. All of our past sins, present sins, and future sins have been put under the blood when we trust Christ. Uh, we're going to heaven. We become sons of God and daughters of God. Now, we're to walk in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit is to know and understand the Spirit of the law as given in Matthew seven twelve, teaching us to um, understand and know the law is to teach us to do unto others as we'd have others do unto us. This is the whole purpose of the law, to teach us to live godly. In doing this, we have in our nature things that detract. We sin after we're saved. This shocks Christians. I don't know why. The difference is when we are forgiven and we're regenerated, we can now walk in the Spirit, but that doesn't do anything to eradicate our old nature and flesh. It's still with us. And you need to deal with that. So God gives us grace. What he told Paul, Paul was concerned about his infirmities. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. We live in grace, and when we sin, God's grace covers us. That isn't a license for sin. That is a God's dealing with the reality of our sin nature and that we're going to let him down. We shouldn't. We should take up a cross daily and crucify the flesh. We need to die to our flesh. Grace in the scriptures is the free, unmerited love and favor of God, the spring and source of all the benefits men receive from him, often accompanied with a favorable influence of God, divine influence, or the influence of the Spirit and renewing the heart and restraining from sin. So if we'll study our Bible, if we'll listen to God, God will lead us away from sin. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abound, grace did much more abound. So God's grace is with us when we repent of our sins and trust Christ for the rest of our lives. We cannot and will not lose our sonship, but we're exhorted and we're saved to good works. We're exhorted to walk in the Spirit not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Now, the thing that we need to understand is that when we're saved, we become children of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We become heirs to an eternal destiny. We become destined for things much better than this earth. And we shouldn't be high-minded we should not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. A man that conforms to the world will think of himself more highly than he ought to think. The scriptures call this pride. Moreover, the law entered. Oh, excuse me. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. That's the general attitude, pride, and state of a lost man. Pharaoh typifies humanity. God has given Pharaoh a commandment. Moses has delivered it to Pharaoh. Pharaoh comes up with the truth. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord. Neither will I let Israel go. He should know the Lord. He doesn't. Pride leads a man, and this is the problem with pride in our being, to 
important independent spirit or the feeling of bitterness over someone has told you about the success or good fortune of someone you do not like. It is a harsh, sarcastic, or unyielding spirit, often with a hidden desire to attract the attention of the opposite sex. That's what pride is. The wicked, through the pride of his continence, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. Human pride will lead a soul to saying and doing things to attract attention to self. Who is the Lord that I should serve him? It leads to a constant complaining with desire to quit trying to do right. What God asked Pharaoh to do was to do right by the Hebrew people. Pharaoh was oppressing them. He was a parasite on the Hebrew people. It will produce an unnatural abusive act towards others and even self. Pride leads to a deceitful, evasive spirit that seeks to create false impressions. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not all his thoughts. The reason it's so hard to win people to Christ, the reason it's so hard to get people to the knowledge of the truth, is because people want to be able to have the liberty to hurt others, to take care of themselves, to be lifted up in their pride and self-love and their own self-righteousness, rather than to learn the righteousness of God and to care for others. The commandment, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. It's quite exemplary of Matthew 7, 12, whatsoever you would that men should do on you, do you so likewise on them. Which is the reason that our failure and sin, we need forgiveness and redemption, and then we need to walk in the spirit and walk in a new life, not subject to the bondage of sin and selfishness, the pride uh, and the way we hurt one another. And boy, do we hurt one another and, and not feeling the people we hurt, their pain, but oh, we're so cognizant of our pain and we so dislike to be harmed, hurt, or done wrong and we cry out for justice but we never consider when we do it to others. And that's the problem. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. God's fellowship is with those that are humble. Humility in ethics is freedom from pride and arrogance. Humbleness of mind, a modest estimate of one's own worth. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Who is the Lord that I should serve him? I will not let Israel go. That's the pride of human nature against the godliness and righteousness of God. That's why Pharaoh went to hell. That's why you're going to hell if you don't repent of your sins and trust Christ as your Savior and you don't have an interest or desire to start learning to be humble and nice to others. All you're thinking about is yourself all the time. You can get mad at the minister for bringing you the true message, but I'm here to give you the truth. I'm not here to patronize you, and I'm not here to make a large congregation, though I'd like to see many people get saved and come and learn of God. I am an ambassador of God to give the words of God. God gives grace to the humble. In theology, humility consists in lowliness of mind, a deep sense of one's own unworthiness in the sight of God. Self-abasement penitence for sin and submission to the divine will. Now, you have to be wise today because he that departed from evil make himself a prey. And when you humble yourself before God, proud and arrogant people will often prey upon you and take advantage. You should keep your humility, but you should be wise and learn how to avoid their abuse. Because the God did not call you to specifically be abused by prideful people, though in service to him you often will be. That's why all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And you're to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. There are a lot of proud and arrogant teachers. 
that claim to be representatives of Christ. They are false prophets. They deceive their own selves because God gives his grace to the humble, not to the proud. God dwells with the humble, not with the proud. Better it is to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. It's very simple to not think more of ourselves than we should as we are created in the image of God. If you're created in the image of God, you should act like, walk like, and talk like God. That makes you godly. The problem we have today, and this is permeating the church, is they're teaching people to be nice. Nice is often wicked. You need to be godly. Nice is you treat everybody in a nice way, but inwardly you're doing it for advantage and gain and to, be, uh, to win favor. Godly is to be truthful and honest and kindly affectionate in truthfulness and honesty, something that's rare today. Niceness is a deception. Godliness is righteousness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. With every hair of our head counted, we are of the most importance as individuals, as as. Human beings, we are the only creatures that can worship God in spirit and truth, and God is seeking desires at relationship with us. But he's not going to have it with us in our pride. We're going to have to humble ourselves. The humility of repentance brings us to salvation. Uh, the humility of walking in the spirit draws us closer to God. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you have more value than many sparrows. As a human being, your soul is of far more value than all the rest of the creation. You are the only creation that can think of the future, that, that can walk with God. You are the only beast on this earth who can lift up their eyes and look into heaven. All the animals that walk the earth look down. Man is the only one that can look up to his creator. The hand of the creator is all over the creation. People just don't see it because of their pride. Though we are of great value with God, that he would purchase us with his own blood, and that's how you get saved. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish, without spot. The humility of Christ, scarcely for a righteous man, some would even dare to die, but while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. The humility of Christ was that he would sacrifice his soul and his blood and shed it on the altar to make a propitiation for our sins, for the ungodly, for the wicked, for the most repugnant individual that ever lived, Christ has died. I am the good shepherd, and I give my life for the sheep. Humility. That's God. Sacrifice. That's God. The opposite of pride and arrogance. Now we become an abomination to him in our human pride. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand joined in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Friend, <clears throat> hellfire is real. They're not preaching anymore because they've gone into pride. <clears throat> they've gone into philosophy, psychology, and they're not preaching and teaching the truth of God's word. There's a famine of hearing the word of God. The teachers and preachers are false. They're telling you what, what you want to hear rather than what you should hear that God would have you to hear, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. If you're in pride, you're an abomination to God. Your destination is hellfire. God is not willing that any should perish, but you're going to have to humble yourself, repent of your sins, and trust Christ, or you're going to burn. You're going to burn for all eternity, and it's a just judgment on your pride and arrogancy. To be proud is having an inordinate self-esteem, possessing a high or unreasonable conceit of one's own excellence, either of body or mind. Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not in the proud, nor such as turn to lies. So in the vanity of the women, it's mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? In the vanity of man, look at me, I'm somebody. No, you're really just one of seven billion, and the mirror really reveals the truth, the aging, the cracking, the chafing, the need 
for paint on a war environment. Man in his best state is altogether vanity, quite empty. It's God's grace, goodness, and humility that saves us. And God did not make us to be the way we are. He made us to be the way he is, and we chose to go the way we are through pride. Who is the Lord? I know not the Lord. Neither will I let Israel go, the proud in the face of the Creator. A man may be proud of his person, proud of his talents, his accomplishments, or his achievements. He may be proud of anything to which he bears some relation. He may be proud of his country, his government, his uh, equipage, or whatever. He may uh, be proud of association. Uh, he may be proud and self-esteemed in himself. Then spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? No, that's uh, God's land. That's God's people. God created the souls. All souls are mine, saith the Lord. They're not yours, Nebuchadnezzar. They don't belong to you. Every soul was, was coming to this existence, came in here by the work of the creator, not by a king that's proud and full of himself. He may even be proud of a religion or his church. He conceives that anything excellent or valuable in which he has a share or to which he stands related contributes to his own importance, and this conception exalts his opinion of himself. Such pride seals the direction of the damned. The original iniquity and pride, that of Satan himself, in the face of a benevolent creator, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in the heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high, yet thou shalt be brought down to the hell, to the sides of the pit. Hell is a true damnation for the proud. The proud are going to hell. It's as simple as that. If you're proud, and you most likely are, if you've never repented of your sins and trusted Christ as your Savior, you're proud, you're too damn proud, you're going to hell. God's going to hold you accountable, you're an abomination to him. You must be born again. But to think soberly, contrary to the proud, to think soberly is not to be given to extremes in thinking in pride or inferiority or false humility so as to feign humility. A lot of people today, are also feigning and pretending they're humble because they know God won't have anything to do with them and they don't realize that God can see through any act or deception. Against This is the honesty of a repentant sinner. Against thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightst be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Moses came up to Pharaoh and said, God said, let my people go. You're abusing them. Against thee only have I sinned, Pharaoh should have said and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and sinned, and my mother conceived me. Behold, thou desirest truth in inward parts, and in the hidden parts thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Thinking soberly means to be truthfully serious in your thinking. The Bible exhorts us, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. This creature filled with pride that will exalt his throne above the throne of God in his imagination, in his wicked imagination, uh, bringing iniquity into the universe, taking that iniquity to the woman and then to the man and bringing the whole human race down in sin and rebellion against God. So that the race spawns people as Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar is this not great Babylon that I have built when he's breathing God's air, eating God's food in God's body, and he has no respect for his creator. He thinks he's arrived and that he's it and he's the epitome. And very soon the epitome is coming in the Antichrist, and God's going to bring him down to the sides of the pit. Thinking soberly means to think truthfully, seriously in your thinking. Be sober. 
be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. There are, and I'd like to give you some 15 signs of false humility. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or in respect of a holy day or of a new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the bodies of Christ. There's a lot of religious people in the world that are not saved, that have never repented. They're just putting on a show and an act of holiness. They're trying to impress everybody else rather than get right with God. They will do these things. They'll give you guilt trips. They'll try to control you with this type of stuff. Let no man beguile you of your reward and a voluntary humility and worship of angels, intruding those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. The proud use religious terms to justify cruel and questionable behavior. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees. These were the religious folks of his time. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. You can always tell when somebody's not right because they go to excess to prove the point that they're right. Now, in my illustrations, I'll use extreme illustrations to show points so people can see it clearly and simply and easily. But in my personal life, I try not to go to excess to anything. Let your moderation be known amongst all men. So it should be for you. People that are excess, when a lady loses her virginity, she usually becomes excessive in trying to pretend she's still a virgin because she's trying to cover up her transgressions. And there's an excessiveness to try to seem holy, act holy, act pure. It's a false humility. There are many other illustrations of life. That's just one I'd give you. I watch people when they're being overly friendly, they're being nice, they're trying to act as though they're humble. Now, godly is to have concern for you because they care for your soul. Nice is treating you the way they should treat you so that they can take advantage of you and deceive you. A humble person admits sin and also receives an honest rebuke no matter how lowly the source. They answer and sound to him, Abraham's our father. The lowly Galilean is rebuking the Pharisees for their sin. They will not receive it. They now come in their piety. Jesus said unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deed to your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceed forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. A humble person admits sin and receives correction. But to the wicked, well, the proud has the inability to laugh at oneself. Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hath reproof shall die. The proud's inability to laugh at oneself when others do the joking. A merry heart doth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. You can really tell a proud person, if they become the center of a joke, they get all offended. They can't handle it. Now, you can joke about me. I like telling Baptist jokes. I like telling preacher jokes. I like telling human jokes. Uh, you can tell jokes. I'm an Englishman. Uh, I'm half Italian. You want to know how to grease your car? You run over a wop. Puts grease all over the car. See, I don't get offended at that. But proud people do. America doesn't laugh anymore. America can't tell jokes anymore. America is too touchy. It's too proud. 
A merry heart doth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. A humble person seeks the honor in his own paradox of sin and sanctification. He can laugh at his own expense because he or she knows that his worth is based not on impressing people, but rather on being the reality of being loved by God. You know what's, you know what will help you to chill out? Repent of your sins, trust Christ. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything, neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Now look, also their love and their hatred, their envy is now perished, neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. You're saved, you're born again, go thy way, eat thy bread with joy, and drink thy wine with a merry heart, for God now accepteth thy works. The proud publicizes their own sacrifices to impress others. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have the reward. God sees right through false humility. People get acting pious, gas bags, uttering words of nothingness, uh, so that people look at them, wow, they're holy. They're quite boring, too. And boring and holiness do not go together. A humble person avoids broadcasting their sacrificial labor. But when thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. The proud uses himself as a standard for others. It's called self-righteousness. Most people look at everybody and you're not like me. If you can't measure up to me, you're not very righteous. But they don't realize that their righteousness is worthless. They don't measure up to God's righteousness, and that's the true standard of righteousness. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. That's what people do all the time. That's what all those magazines that they make millions of dollars off and all this thing with Hollywood, it's staring and comparing one against another. It's proud, it's vanity, it's meaningless. All flesh is hell father. You better repent of your sins and trust Christ as your Savior. Judgment's coming. God can see through it. But a humble person looks at the life of Jesus Christ as the example and points people to him. And if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to me. You do not need to be like the preacher or the sister in the pew or the brother in the pew. You need to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. He is the example. He is the epitome of holiness, righteousness, humility, truth, godliness, character, virtue, justice. Jesus Christ came to show us how to live. Besides, redeem us. The proud affects a humble tone of voice while saying proud things. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouths speak great swelling words. Well, you know, she's a very wonderful and great person, but having men's person and admiration because of advantage. And again, it's that wicked game of pride we already talked about. Good on television, they're learning their trade from hell and Hollywood. But a humble person doesn't need to affect the tone of his voice to sound mealy-mouthed in order to convince others that he's humble. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. The Lord Jesus Christ, the most humble of all, spoke authoritatively. The proud believes that eschewing money or fame is the same thing as being humble. True, what does it profit man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? But that's not what the scriptures teach. Remove fire from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Because a humble person understands that pride comes from the heart and not from possessions. Whoso privately slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that hath a high look and a proud heart will not I suffer. The proud 
professes love for God and neighbor, but acts in a cruel manner. The merciful man doth good to his own soul, but he that is cruel troubles his own house. A humble person is consistent between what he or she says and what he or she does. Only by pride cometh contention, but what the well advised is wisdom. The proud are very easily offended. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. The touchy-feely people get so offended so quickly because they are so proud and they are so fixed on themselves. But those that know the law and ways of God have great peace, and they are not offended. A humble person is quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. The heart of the prudent getteth knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeketh knowledge. And the knowledge that every soul needs is the knowledge of God and his ways. The proud believes that asceticism leads to holiness. I am not interested, nor is God interested in you living in an Amish paradise. All this stuff with abusive clothing, heavy clothing. Now, God doesn't want you to be lewd and sensual. God doesn't want you to be sullen and reveal passive anger holier now people have nothing to do with God they're very proud which say stand by thyself come not near to me for I am holier than thou these are a smoke in my nose a fire that burneth all the day and they're going to burn for eternity but a humble person recognizes that sin comes from the heart not from pleasure Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. The proud loves to impose his own opinion on others as truth, but he's not preaching or teaching the truth of God. He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife, but he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. But a humble person acts charitably to all, thinks the best for others, and avoids presenting his opinion on a disputable matter as ultimate truth. Now the end of the commandment is charity of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith on faith. The proud enjoys judging other people. The righteous do not. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Now, this is the thing that needs to be understood. He that's spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Today we have uh, many sins. Adultery is a sin. Those who commit adultery are sinners. That's not judging individuals. Sodomites are sexually perverse. The conduct of sodomy is an abomination to God. That's judging things. That's telling the truth. That's not judging people. If the shoe fits, you might wear it, but that's your problem, not the messenger of God's righteousness. And you used to be awful proud because you're getting awful offended. Uh, if you're living a clean, holy, godly, humble life, Nothing should be offending you. It doesn't bother me when preachers preach about sin. It shouldn't bother you. Great peace of they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend you. Why are you so touchy? Why are you so angry? You know what? I'm here to tell you you're going to hell, and I'm trying to tell you how to get out of going to hell. Repent of your sins. Trust Christ as your Savior. Humble yourself before God. And you'll get assurance from God. You'll get joy and peace. You'll have peace with God. You'll have peace within you won't be touchy-feely anymore. But a humble person hands judgment over to God and instead busies himself with loving her neighbor or his neighbor and serving God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, 
leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. The people who exhibit false humility spend a lot of time telling you how humble they are. They write books like The Ten Steps to Humility and How I Achieved It. Whoso boasts himself of a false gift is like clouds and wind without rain. Spiritually abusive people understand that God values humility. They also realize that few people follow an obviously proud person. So they cloak their cruel behavior with religious sounding language and get offended when other people question their motives. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed into ministers of righteousness, who ends shall be according to their works. And Jesus said, leave them, they are false teachers. But he answered and said, every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone, they be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Now, the pride of man has brought us into perilous time because, you know, when we teach righteousness, the human nature is so corrupt that when it starts doing right, and behaving as it should, it starts getting proud of its good conduct. And you need to realize this. You shouldn't be proud of it. You should do it. Because it's your duty to do right. The reason this is an entitlement generation, the reason that this is a generation of destruction, is the ministers have been patronizing the sinners rather than preaching to the sinners. They've been begging the sinners to stay in church, don't leave church, stay with God. I'm going to promise you all kinds of good stuff. Hey, buddy, that's not the way it is. Do right simply because it's right to do right, and if you do wrong, it's wrong, and God will hold you accountable. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Judgment day is coming. And that's the truth. Get ready to meet your God. So Jeremiah ended his ministry with a lot of tribulation, preaching to the ending generation of Israel. This is what he had to say. Oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place of wayfaring men, that I might leave my people and go from them, for they be all adulterers and assembly of treacherous men. Jeremiah said, man, I need to get away from this generation. It is just too wicked to endure. Can't blame them. It's kind of like America today. This is not the country I was born in. It has rejected the words of God. There is a famine of hearing of the words of God. And the minister are in conspiracy. They're trying to get prosperity and they're trying to get success rather than to bring the truth of God's word to an erring, lost, populous of proud sinners. I'm your friend. God saved me from myself. You need to be saved from yourself. You need to have the righteousness of Christ. Yours is not good enough. Don't be so proud. 